you so much for joining us today. I'm Emmy Betts and I serve as the direct Deputy Director for the Injury and Violence Prevention Center here at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. And I also lead the Firearm Injury Prevention Initiative. Today's presentation is part of our monthly research to practice webinar series, where we present topics in injury and violence prevention. And before I introduce our speakers for today, I wanna uh, just note a few logistics. So this session will be recorded and we will send the, uh, the video link to everyone who registered. Uh, we'll also put the link for past webinars in the chat box if you're interested in seeing uh, prior sessions. Please put any questions you might have into the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be having a moderated Q uh, question and answer period at the end. And then please mark your calendars for our other webinars. Uh, this year in 2021, they'll be each month on the second Tuesday of the month at noon mountain time. And next, next month we'll be talking about fall prevention. And then after today, if you're excited to keep talking about ERPOs in Colorado, you can join us tomorrow, Wednesday, for a more informal discussion group at 4 p.m. Mountain. If you're interested in that, please contact uh, me or Lucia uh, via the registration email. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Uh, today's webinar will examine the implementation of Colorado's Extreme Risk Protection Order, or ERPO, uh, through the lens of both researchers and legal practitioners. Our first speaker is Leslie Barnard, who is a graduate student in the DRPH program at the Colorado School of Public Health. And I have had the great fortune of getting to work with her this year, uh, and she's been coordinating our research project on ERPOs in Colorado in 2020. Leslie received her MPH in epidemiology from Tulane University and previously worked as an epidemiologist in state and local health departments. And after, after Leslie, we'll have Adam Rice, who I'm thrilled could join us today. Adam is counsel to the Attorney General of Colorado, Phil Weiser. And in that role, he advises the Attorney General and leads a range of special projects uh, to further the Attorney General's affirmative legal policy agenda. He received a JD from Yale Law School and a BA in government from Dartmouth. Uh, he began his career as an elementary school teacher in Newark, New Jersey. And I have to say, I'm not sure which seems harder or worse, uh, elementary school or legal practice. <laughs> but I guess that's why I went into medicine, I guess. So Adam, thank you for joining us. Um, first, we'll turn it over to Leslie. Again, please put questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, oh, sorry, I'm not at the beginning. Sorry about that. All right, thanks for the intro, Emmy. Um, my name is Leslie Barnard. I'm a first year DRPH student in the EPI program at the Colorado School of Public Health, um, and I'll be talking about our research experience looking to the looking into the first year of Colorado's red flag law. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge the research team in the upper right corner. Without them, this presentation wouldn't be possible. Um, so we're going to talk through the process of doing this research, including some preliminary results. Um, we really wanted to highlight some of the interesting features and challenges of doing this work, though. So some background on ERPOs. Um, extreme Risk Protection Orders, or ERPOs um, for short, are commonly known as red flag laws, um, and they've been enacted in 19 states and the District of Columbia. Colorado is one of the most recent states passing this kind of law in 2019 whereas Connecticut was one of the first passing theirs in 1999. Um, the laws allow for designated individuals, so law enforcement officers, um, family members or intimate partners, and people who reside together to petition for temporary restriction of firearm access for a person with imminent risk to themselves or others. And when a court grants an ERPO, the respondent must surrender all firearms and may not acquire any additional firearms. Um, so there was significant controversy both in the passage of Colorado's ERPO law and in the plan rollout and, and implementation. So we sought to review all the ERPOs that were, that were petitioned in Colorado, um, describe their use and identify any potential misuse. Um, these are local and national headlines related to the controversy, fear and debate around Colorado's ERPO law. Um, some counties were supportive of the law whereas others um, went as far as to claim to be sanctuary counties saying that they would not um, enforce the law. So we were really interested in how this unfolded and whether or not the controversy could have potentially been avoided. 
Um, the first step of the data collection process is relatively simple. Um, so basically through the state online request system, we are able to obtain the number of petitions or requests for ERPOs, the case numbers and their corresponding counties. Um, but the difficult part is figuring out which of these petition, petitions were granted and under what circumstances and why. So each county had a different combination of the request process, um, a different combination of payment method and the method of returning the documents to us. Uh, so an example of how complicated this, um, this request process got was um, we, we would initiate contact um, that could be via email or um, an official county specific form that we had to fill out. Um, filled out that form, waited for a, a clerk to look up the case, um, gather all the documents and send us an estimate for the cost. And then we would either send a credit card payment or a check and they would either email them to us or we would have to send a self-addressed envelope with postage where they would send back hard copies to us, which then um, we would have to scan and upload so that our abstractors could um, look into all the cases so we can evaluate them. So it's definitely um, a bulky and cumbersome process. So to attempt to quantify this work, um, we came up with some process measures. Uh, the total cost of obtaining the petitions was uh, just under $1,400. So not an insignificant amount of money. Um, it took me about 180 hours to collect all of the data from each of the courts. And uh, it took 95, approximately 95 hours to abstract all the data. The average time it takes to abstract one petition was about 40 minutes, but that was really variable because some of the petitions were only about three pages, whereas some were over 200 pages. So preliminary results. Um, there were a total of 109 ERPOs filed in Colorado in 2020. Um, this is a heat map of the total ERPOs filed per 100,000 population in Colorado counties. Um, the gray areas indicate where counties where zero ERPOs were filed. Um, there are 43 counties where zero were filed. Um, the highest proportion of um, ERPOs filed were in Denver, which for those of you who are not from Colorado, Denver is that tiny little sliver um, right here in between Clear Creek and Arapahoe right there. Um, and so they had 35% of petitions filed there, um, whereas Dolores had the highest um, number per, per population. So as I said, there were 109 petitions filed in Colorado in 2020. Um, 19 we had to exclude for lack of evidence. Uh, some of the petitions were filed in December of 2020. So we ha they haven't worked their way through the system yet. So we're not sure what their outcome is. Um, we also had to exclude 12 um, that we deemed dupl as duplicates. So those petitions um, were where the person, the people involved were the, the same and the circumstances around the reason for filing the petition was also the same. They were just filed multiple times. Uh, so that left 78 for us to evaluate. Uh, 57 out of the 78, so nearly three quarters were granted TERPOs. Uh, TERPOs are temporary ERPOs, which are two week ERPOs that are approved by a judge and go into effect before a full hearing. Um, is held for the full 365 day ERPO. Um, and a TERPO has to be granted for an ERPO to be considered. Um, and of the TERPOs that were dismissed, half were due to lack of information um, or not meeting the burden of proof. And the other half were um, improper use, uh, clerical issues or redundancy. So if the person filed the ERPO in the wrong county, for example. So uh, 46 out of the 57, so 80% um, with TERPOs granted, went on to have their full 365-day ERPOs granted. And of those, nearly a quarter had threats against themselves only, a third had threats against others only, and the remaining 41% had both. Uh, so we identified four cases of potential misuse that were, um, and all of those were denied or dismissed. Um, and only one that we know of resulted in legal consequences. Uh, so I'm gonna walk through a couple of examples of these. Uh, one, uh, as you can see that the headline um, highlights this case was a woman whose child was killed in an officer involved shooting. Uh, she filed against the law enforcement officer claiming to share a child with that person. Um, and so that was a misrepresentation of their relationship. And she is actually the one who's suffering legal consequences, legal consequences as a result of that 
misrepresentation. Um, another example is um, where a citizen filed against an entire law enforcement office agency, um, and there was no specific person named in the petition, but the person claimed that they all resided together. So that was dismissed because that's not an appropriate relationship. Um, there was another example where a prisoner filed against a guard, again, claiming that they resided together. So also not, not an accurate depiction of their relationship. Um, and then lastly, there was a neighbor filing against another neighbor who described them shooting, um, shooting their drone. Uh, and they, there was no relationship put on this petition. Um, again, none of, none of these were, were approved, but rather than um, malintent, some of these cases show that there's an opportunity for public education surrounding the law and who's exactly allowed to file them. So next steps, um, we're really grateful to be a part of a multi-site evaluation um, where we'll be evaluating outcomes, circumstances, and predictors associated with ERPOs being filed and granted. And then some recommendations that we have um, to make this research easier here in Colorado, a centralized database would be great, <laughs> as well as a uniform request process across um, the different counties. And um, these petitions aren't meant for research, but in order to evaluate the law, this type of work is necessary and those recommendations we think should be taken up. And then for other states who are interested in this type of research, um, getting a contact to help initiate the process and navigate it is um, really beneficial as well as some patience. Um, so with that, we're really grateful for Adam Rice for all of his help navigating the process. And um, I'll turn it over to him and answer questions later. Great, thank you, Leslie. Let me share my screen as well. Okay. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Glad to be here. As Emmy mentioned, uh, I'm Adam Rice, uh, counsel to Attorney General Weiser. I'm just going to uh, share uh, in a little bit more detail some of the specific provisions of uh, Colorado's ERPO law or the um, Deputy Zachary Parrish the Third Violence Prevention Act, as it is formally titled, um, and uh, looking forward to, to the conversation and questions and answers afterwards. So, so as Leslie mentioned, uh, Colorado is not the um, not the first state, uh, not close. In fact, um, we're kind of uh, the middle of a or towards the tail end of a, a wave in 2018 through 2020, uh, adding uh, red flag or bow laws. And let me just get in here to to the kind of the nuts and bolts of how the act works. So uh, starting at the at the top, um, this is the, the operative language. So um, for either a temporary or starting for the temporary ERPO uh, to be issued, the respondent has to pose a significant risk of causing personal injury to themselves or others in the near future by having in his or her custody or control a firearm or by purchasing, possessing or receiving a firearm. Uh, and so it's this significant risk of causing injury um, and in the near future, kind of imminently, that's relevant to, um, to a temporary or well. Um, again, the process is petitioning to the court, a family or household member or law enforcement. Uh, the petition needs to be under oath and penalty of perjury, and there needs to be specific facts, uh, statements or actions to support uh, the reasonable belief of the petitioner that the respondent does in fact pose a significant risk of causing uh, injury by a firearm. Uh, a court can grant a temporary ERPO by a preponderance of the evidence. So preponderance just means uh, more likely than not. Um, and again, here as, as relevant to the temporary ERPO, uh, this risk needs to be um, in the near future. Uh, and then finally, there are a set of factors listed in the statute to kind of guide courts in making these determinations. Um, if a temporary or vote is issued by a court, uh, the court has to give notice uh, to the respondent of a full or bow hearing or the kind of 364 day or bow hearing. And that hearing has to occur within 14 days. The temporary or bow will then expire uh, 
at the time of the hearing regarding the, the 364 day ergo, or if the petition is otherwise withdrawn. So moving over now, this slide uh, looks pretty similar uh, and for good reason. Uh, this is the, the full 364 day ERPO process. It does share a lot of similarities with the temporary ERPO process, but I'll highlight a few places where it's different. Um, so uh, similarities, again, who can petition, family, household member, or law enforcement, again, under oath, under penalty of perjury, and again, needing specific statements, facts, and actions to support the petition. Um, the kind of due process protections um, that were mentioned earlier, uh, you know, do, this was an important part of the statute as, uh, as enacted and you know, an important part of the conversations um, prior to enactment and ongoing about how to, to strike the right balance here. Um, the due process protections before the 364 day ERPO can be issued, there needs to be notice to the petitioner. So petitioner needs to be aware that it, um, this hearing is happening and the petitioner gets an opportunity to be heard, which means they're at this full hearing, petitioner can present evidence, can cross-examine, um, excuse me, the respondent can present evidence, can cross-examine um, the, the petitioner's case as well. Uh, and importantly, the respondent has a right to an attorney uh, that uh, is um, paid for by the state of Colorado. Um, the respondent's not obligated to use the state appointed and state funded attorney, um, but this is important so that um, the respondent's wealth or lack thereof is not a, a factor preventing their ability to have, um, to have legal counsel. Um, and this is actually one aspect where Colorado's law is different than a lot of the ERPO laws that preceded it. Uh, many of them do require, um, do give uh, the respondent the right to have counsel present, but um, do not um, provide that the state will actually pay for and provide that counsel. Uh, and then another important difference, so in terms of how um, the court grants an ERPO, the standard here for a 364-day ERPO is clear and convincing evidence. So this is uh, more than just a preponderance, more than just a you know, 50% plus one or a more likely than not standard. Uh, but it's, the evidence needs to be clear and convincing in order for a court to, to grant the full ERPO. Uh, and then finally, those, those same kind of factors uh, and the significant risk of injury are the, the key issues for a court to be deciding here. Moving along, a couple of other relevant provisions. Um, termination, so this is a, also kind of part of the due, the due process considerations uh, is that if a 364 day ERPO is granted by a court, uh, the respondent has the right to request a hearing uh, to terminate that ERPO. And um, again, this is a similar standard, clear and convincing, uh, but if the respondent can demonstrate to the, to the court by clear and convincing evidence that they no longer pose a significant risk of injury to self or others uh, by having a firearm, then the court can terminate the ERPO prior to its expiration date. Uh, and in addition, the court can decide to continue the hearing uh, if the court finds that there might be a strong possibility uh, that they would find a clear and convincing um, case of no significant risk at some point in the future, uh, but prior to the expiration date. And then finally, uh, renewal. So again, um, there is a process that enables the, um, the petitioner uh, or, or law enforcement to seek renewal uh, of the ERPO. This is very similar to the standards for the initial 364 day ERPO hearing. Again, notice the respondent and a clear and convincing uh, evidence standard. Here is just a, a set of, of some of the other specifics um, in the statute, some of the kind of nitty gritty of how the process works. So if a, an ERPO is issued, uh, the respondent is required to relinquish their firearms. They can either sell those firearms to a federally licensed firearms dealer, or they can arrange for the firearms to be stored by law enforcement. And similarly, uh, they're required to relinquish any concealed carry permit. Uh, and then at the end of uh, 
for the ERPA when it terminates or expires upon request, uh, law enforcement is required to return the firearms in question uh, within three days, so long as the respondent is otherwise lawfully allowed to, to have the firearms. And then just a few other, um, at the bottom, the final three bullets, just a few other petitions, uh, or excuse me, provisions. Um, in particular, I'll highlight the, um, the point noted earlier, which is that there are, the statute does provide for uh, the possibility of legal liability for those who file malicious or false petitions. Uh, it gives discretion to, uh, to local law enforcement as to um, how to pursue those, uh, those actions. So moving along, um, there have been uh, a couple of constitutional uh, legal challenges to the ERPO statute itself. Uh, some of the grounds that challengers have, have brought um, one is right to bear arms, so the, the Second Amendment that many of us are, are familiar with, as well as its, its corresponding, though not identical, provision under the Colorado Constitution. Um, due process protections, so we noted these before, um, that take a couple of forms. Um, one is around you know, whether there is adequate notice and opportunity to be heard. And then a uh, related point, the third bullet talks about uh, vagueness which is essentially a challenge, um, is another form of a due process challenge. Uh, thus far, and this is, if I refer to the, the kind of citation at the bottom, um, you know, this is uh, a decision from a county court in Gunnison County last year uh, in response to a, a constitutional challenge. And this is, um, these are just quotations from that court's decision um, noting that the various provisions of the act um, in the court's opinion are indeed constitutional. And so this is um, both in terms of the right to bear arms, noting that the, the law is really focused not on restricting law abiding responsible citizens, but is rather targeted to a specific, um, to a specific class of individuals, uh, those who pose significant risk of injury to self or others. Um, and uh, that it's reasonably related to the, the government's public safety or legitimate interest in preventing um, violence using firearms and uh, public safety. And then similarly, the court found that the act provides adequate due process protections. Uh, the court noted many of the aspects of the law that I um, pointed to earlier, um, namely uh, that notice is provided to the respondents that there's a full hearing where the respondent can, prevent, uh, can present evidence and cross-examine uh, the opposing side, where there's opportunity for or a right to court-appointed counsel, um, there's an opportunity for early termination, and that the standard, again, is more than just a preponderance of evidence to grant a full ERPO. Uh, and then finally, the court noted that the act is not uh, un unconstitutionally or unpermissibly vague uh, because it does, in fact, provide um, particular notice of the grounds for issuing an ERPO, uh, as well as clear standards to guide the courts. And so that's, again, this kind of touch point of the standard of significant risk of causing personal injury to self or others, uh, and then the various factors included in the act itself uh, that help courts to, to in, in determining whether or not there is in fact that significant risk. So Obviously, there will uh, there may very well be other um, other challenges, other court decisions. But in terms of thinking about the first year, what we've seen thus far, um, here at least um, one court has weighed in, noting that the, the act is in fact constitutional. So with that, I will turn it back, Emmy, to you, uh, and look forward to question and answer. Yeah. Great, thanks. And Leslie, you can come on back on too if you want. Um, I know we have a couple of questions in the Q&A already and I'm gonna take moderator prerogative and ask a couple of first two, but please um, bring the questions in. Um, one thing I would just wanted to highlight something, Adam, that you just said about, you know, there's more to come, that it's only been a year. And so of course we don't know what happens after the 364 day period, but that, that's probably, uh, obvious to folks, but I just want to make it clear. We don't know if any guns were returned yet because we we literally haven't gotten to the, the calendar time periods. Um, 
I did have a question for Leslie that I think may come up. Um, can you comment on, in the cases we saw, how many actually resulted in confiscation of firearms? Sure, yeah. So um, of those that were approved, which um, was 47, I believe, uh, 31 uh, had their firearms, doc documentation of their firearms being confiscated. Wait, 30, 31 or 13? 31. 31. Okay, sorry, I had it wrong in my head. Thank you. Yeah. And um, a reminder to, to listeners as well that the ERPOs can be filed in a case where a person actually doesn't have firearms yet, but it prohibits them from purchasing. So there was one case at least where uh, the individual had numerous documented um, uh, mental health issues and had made numerous threats, didn't have firearms yet, but was um, there was concern that he was going to attempt to purchase. And so um, there were some cases where there were no firearms yet, but the, but the intent was to prevent it. Um, okay, so let's jump into questions. First question, uh, Leslie, what is going on in Dolores County? <laughs> Why was it so high? <laughs> yeah, so um, that's a product of this law being new and we only, we only have 109 cases in Colorado. So there was actually only one petition filed in Dolores, but the population of Dolores County is so much smaller than the rest of the Colorado counties that did have herbos that that just bumped up their per population rate. Yeah, specifically, I think I just looked it up and it's like 2000 people live in that county that's pretty large. So that's why the rate is so high. Um, and then next question also for Leslie, um, uh, commenting on the fact that we saw a lot of overlap in terms of reasons why they were filed for both risk of harm to self and risk of harm to others. Um, and, and they were wondering more specifically, can you comment on the, the risk of harm to others, sort of mass shootings versus domestic violence and so forth, um, what we saw? Sure, yeah. So we haven't looked at the if there's any differences between those that have a combination of threats to self and threats to others versus only threats to, to others. But of the of the petition that did have threats to others. Um, it split um, almost two thirds um, an identified specific person. So an intimate partner, a family member or a friend um, versus threats to a group or class of people. So like law enforcement or children, for example. Okay, yeah, great. Um, Okay, this next question, and I, I think I'll ask Leslie to start, and then um, Adam, please feel free to jump in. Um, there are a couple questions related to who filed them, so family members versus law enforcement. Um, I do want to say one thing, too. I know there are some clinicians on the call. I want to make it clear, in Colorado, healthcare providers are not allowed to file for an ERPO. They need to come from a family member or from law enforcement. Um, so, um, can you talk a little bit, Leslie, about what we were seeing in terms of who seemed to be filing them, as well as the sort of proportion that seemed to be um, granted? Sure. Yeah. So both for filing and the ones that are granted, um, by far law enforcement is, is the petitioning um, agency. So um, I think it's of those granted, um, over 90 percent of those that are approved have law enforcement as a petitioner. And I think one thing that's hard to tell from the from the cases we reviewed was the, the sort of question of did law enforcement file because they were encouraged to do so by a family and they were actually doing it on behalf of the family that the, the court records, especially county to county, vary widely. And so we couldn't always tell, um, you know, wh what the relationship between family members and law enforcement was in terms of the conversations they had in filing that um, I think we also don't know necessarily why they were more likely um, to be granted. Um, Adam, can I ask you to, to speculate? I would think that perhaps if law enforcement was filing an order like this, they might have more of the sort of necessary information for it to go forward in court. Is that a kind of fair um, uh, educated guess to make in terms of uh, versus family and the kind of information they might be providing? We don't, I mean, I, haven't looked as carefully at each individual or bow as as you all have done in, in the research to get a sense of that. But you know, certainly law enforcement are repeat players and you know regular practitioners in uh, in courts. And so they are certainly familiar with the the standard way to present that type of information and you know are are likely to have you know, deeply looked at the, the statute and and be kind of uh, responsive to it in, in that way. Um, so yeah, I think it's 
it's fair to speculate that um, law enforcement is well situated to present their um, the relevant information in a way that is um, going to do provide what courts need to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. And and there was a question about whether when family had them granted, whether it was because they sort of had help in the process. And we don't know that from the court records, just to answer that question that we, we weren't able to tell. Um, Leslie, can you talk a little bit about what we saw in terms of um, filings in the wrong counties? Yeah, I was just about to mention that. Um, so I think law enforcement are not likely to make that mistake, but um, there were at least five cases where the petition was denied, not due to lack of evidence or lack of validity for the petition um, being requested, but they, the petitioner filed in the county that they lived in rather than the county that the respondent lived in. So just um, clerical issues. Yeah, and we couldn't tell whether they were subsequently then filed in the correct county. So when, you know, I think one thing going forward is to think about the information that law enforcement agencies have and guidance on this in terms of what to do if someone is trying to file, you know, how do they, or can they sort of point them in the right direction towards the correct county. Um, and certainly as Leslie mentioned, every county is a little different in how they, um, how they handle things. Speaking of that, so there are a bunch of questions that I, I was hoping we would get to about Second Amendment sanctuary counties. Um, just by way of background, there were a number of counties, and I'm seeing, trying, seeing if I can find the list, um, a number of counties in Colorado that decided to, like the term they used was Second Amendment sanctuaries, that they were saying that they didn't want to um, implement the ERPA laws when they went um, into effect. So um, I guess open it up to both of you, um, maybe Adam first, have you, do you have any insight into sort of what's happened in those counties um, over time and have there been cases where um, they've refused to even file a petition, for example, or have those counties mounted additional legal challenges that you know of? I'm not aware any of, of instances where, um, where, law enforcement, you know, as a practical matter has refused to, um, to proceed with, with petitioning for an ERPA. Um, I, I do think that raises one of the, one of the kind of questions for us to continue to be considering as, as, you know, the, the ground shifts and we start to see implementation. I, I will say, um, I think anecdotally that there has, um, law enforcement who have been involved either in, in bringing petitions or in some of the, the kind of serving and, uh, and, and acting out the enforcement of, um, of our posts have been able to, um, you know, use their judgment and their, the tools available to them um, to um, navigate some of the, the kind of the challenges uh, that could, could arise. Um, with, uh, with ERPA, with you know, particularly um, in instances where the respondent might not be fully cooperative, or you know, might not be, um, might also be having mental health challenges, et cetera. And so, I do think that there will be, um, hopefully, some some best practices and lessons learned from the jurisdictions that have seen more, have, you know, have become in this first year, regular practitioners of, you know, both the petitioning process and the executing um, enforcement process. Um, as well, I think the other piece to note is, you know, we have seen, I think it's, it's correct to say fewer ERPOs, both petitions for ERPO and then ERPOs issued than, um, you know, some of the best estimates prior to, um, to enactment. Um, as well, uh, and insofar as um, household members, in addition to law enforcement, are um, authorized to bring those petitions, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem uh, it's speculating, but you know, it, it's it's not clear that it's the the lack of um, the relative lack, I should say, of of petitions sought is due to law enforcement refusing to engage in the process. I uh, had to remind myself to and to look up the list. I think there were 
40, 39 counties in Colorado that at least at some point adopted Second Amendment sanctuary kinds of resolutions. Um, and many of those are actually on the list of places that have that had ERPOs um, either petitions or um, granted um, in 2020. And I think, as Adam said, we don't really know what the rate should be in those places. You know, the, the numbers are too small for us to really know if there are outliers in terms of counties that um, should be filing more, should not be filing so many. So um, I think it's a it's a hard question. But but so far, I don't think we saw clear evidence that those Second Amendment sanctuary counties were either not allowing petitions to be filed or were not enforcing them if they were granted. That, Leslie, do you want to add anything on that? No, I think you covered it. Yeah, we didn't see any, any in the cases that we do know about and in the documentation that we do have for those that are filed, it didn't, um, I don't think to any of any of us seem like there was any anything fishy going on. <laughs> um, I think one of the, the questions for sort of future work will be um, what's happening at the time that uh, that if an ERPO is granted that what happens when law enforcement actually has to go um, uh, look check for weapons confiscate weapons and so forth and um, I think that's a really valid question from law enforcement agencies in terms of you know what what have the negative outcomes been have people been threatened or harmed um, and that information was not generally not included in most of the court documents we saw, unfortunately. So it's it, it, we can't really know what's been happening. Um, and uh, it's certainly an area that I think deserves some some further attention in terms of how that piece is being implemented, what are, what are the best practices. Um, I talked to one law enforcement um, uh, official from uh, the Denver metro area who is saying that they have sort of a group of officers who tend to be the ones who always um, are the ones when it has happened that they're the team that goes to to, to confiscate weapons or basically um, put the ERPO in place and they you know they do things like try to figure out when the person won't be home but families there and so forth um, so they've developed some strategies within their own unit um, to try to minimize um, confrontations but it's a I think a open question. Um, Adam, do you happen to know on the sort of state level is something, do you know if there's information sharing going on between law enforcement agencies about how they handle these once they're actually in place? I would assume that there is, but I'm not, uh, I can't point you directly to, um, to, to exactly where or how that's, that's happening. Um, but, you know, I can speak from experience to, to note that um, there are, various formal and informal channels where law enforcement leaders, sheriffs, and others are regularly in, in communication with each other. Um, and so I, I would be shocked if there is not um, that information sharing and that kind of collaborative, um, you know, best practices and lessons learned um, in, in real time going on. Great. Um, Leslie, there's a question um, about uh, mental health assistance in in uh, individuals who had either TERPOs or ERPOs filed against them. Can you comment on sort of what we what was in the data or not in the data in terms of what those what resources are offered? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I I will say I think there's a lot more that we don't know about this than we do know. Um, but there were a, a handful of cases, I can think of three that off the top of my head, where uh, TERPO was granted and in the hearing for the full ERPO um, mental health services or um, other kinds of support services were mandated. And if that person adhered to that um, and went through the, getting those services, um, the ERPOs would be terminated early or they would um, not approve the full ERPO. Um, I think it's a great question, though, and I think it, it, it highlights one of the things we like to do in these research to practice webinars is talk about the challenges of injury prevention research and then sort of practice in the real world and that there's not, for example, a database linking medical records with um, these legal records for good reason, but it means that we actually have, in many cases, very limited information about whether a person was already receiving care or um, what resources um, they were offered, encouraged, or required um, to seek. And, uh, you know, certainly one would hope that if um, 
that that it got to the point of needing this kind of a petition that there would be, whether it's mental health resources or counseling for uh, domestic violence, uh, alcohol abuse and so forth. Um, there was a lot of substance abuse, I would say too, that we saw in there. Um, uh, let me know, I'm just, there's a, lots of great questions. Oh, um, Leslie, probably a question for you, Adam, you may know too, um, where the firearms are stored when they're confiscated. So I, I, Mm -hmm. I believe they can be transferred to a family member as long as they don't live in the same house. Um, so there was definitely cases of that or um, they would be stormed, stored um, at the law enforcement agency. And I think if there were any cases where they were stored at other FFLs or if that was allowed, we didn't have that information. So uh, I don't know if that's allowed in some counties. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. Um, uh, so question on the check on individuals complying with relinquishment. Um, Adam, at a high level, can you talk about what this law says in terms of if an ERPO is file is granted and it, an individual is required to relinquish weapons, where does the sort of burden fall on doing that? Is it on the Law enforcement agency? Is it on the individual? Is it both? It's a little bit of both. Um, the, the individual respondent is required to make an attestation to the court within a period of time, I can't recall, it's either 48 or 72 hours, um, relatively shortly after the ERPA was issued, essentially saying, um, you know, what, the, what they have done with the firearms or that they did not actually possess at the time of the possess firearms at the time their vote was issued and nor do they currently. Um, there's also a burden on um, law enforcement uh, to essentially go, go back to the court um, if law enforcement has reason to believe that um, the respondent still has firearms um, that they did not relinquish uh, and the, the court can then uh, issue, um, take additional action to try to facilitate uh, the, the resolution of that process. So there's a little bit on um, on both fronts. Um, in an ideal world, the, the respondent um, you know is is responsive and, and complies quickly. Um, but there are the statute does um, contemplate what would happen if that doesn't occur. Uh, thank you. And then. Uh, Leslie, I think this is a question for you related to that. Do we um, know the difference in the sort of confiscated versus relocated, like given to family or friend? I, we haven't collected that, but um, it's definitely a good question. Maybe we should. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just say, you know, for the researchers in the audience, one of the challenges is that, uh, as we alluded to before, every court record is a little different in terms of the information they include or not. So there aren't sort of standardized like check boxes or areas where they document exactly what's happening to things. So the the, the tracking and evaluation piece um, is not maybe as clean as, as the researchers among us would really like it to be. <laughs> um, and maybe that's an area for, for uh, thinking about improvement. Um, uh, Adam, question for you. Are there any more legal cases or challenges um, that are outstanding on ERPOs that you know of um, besides the, the, you talked about the Gunnison case. Are there any other outstanding that you know of? There, there's at least one in Denver where there is, um, there's a kind of extended um, hearing process still, still ongoing. Um, and there may be one other, but off the top of my head, I'm not, um, I'm not recalling um, where it is, and I'm, I'm not aware of any um, of any others. But um, it doesn't mean that that they're not out there. <laughs> and are there any others that have been resolved that you can comment on? So, um, obviously, as as you, you all have found in the research, there are a number of just the ERPOs themselves that have been where there's been a resolution. You know, courts have entered or not entered the. The ERPO order, um, but I assume the, the question is referring to kind of the, the constitutional um, challenges. And on that front, um, 
none that I'm aware of. I did see in the Q and A that there was reference to the um, the, the lawsuit challenging the process by which the law was enacted. Um, but that is uh, separate from the types of challenges, you know, specifically. We can set that aside, at least for the conversation about the, the specific provisions um, and the constitutionality of you know, the actual content of the, of the law separate from the, the process pieces. Okay. Um, all right. Now, this next one is a good one, and it got a thumbs up. It got upvoted. So, and I admit, I don't know the answer to it. So, um, Adam, we might make you answer since you're the lawyer. <laughs> if Okay. So, if there's an adolescent who is at um, threat of harm, say to self or to others, can the ERPO process be used to re temporarily remove the firearm from a parent? And I would assume there would have to be provisions that the parent is not adequately securing the firearm from the youth so that they are allowing the youth access. Um, so could you file it on the parent in that case? Um, good question. Um, I'm gonna decline to speculate, but um, we'll give some additional uh, careful reading of the statute. And um, if there's a, a clear answer, uh, happy to, to circle back okay. later. Thanks. And, you know, I will say of the, all the cases we saw, they were all adults. Uh, so this, this particular case did not come up, at least in the petitions that we reviewed. Um, and I think one, I think Leslie, you mentioned this in your talk, but you know, one other thing we saw is that sometimes things were dismissed because there was a different, a different law that made more sense. So for example, domestic violence restraining order, there was one case where I think there was threatened intimate partner violence, but it wasn't specifically with a firearm and firearms weren't really the, the key issue. And so actually I think that one flipped over to um, the kind of bigger umbrella of domestic violence um, restraining order. So it may be that in the case of, uh, this adolescent that it may even be that an ERPO is not the right um, right tool, but we can try to find out an answer and send it out with the notes if we get one. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, Do, are there processes in place to ensure that those who have an ERPO filed against them, that they're entered into the background check system with CBI so they can't uh, purchase another firearm. The question says later on, I assume they mean within the period of the ERPO since it's a 364 day order. Um, Adam, can you comment a little bit? I assume there's some kind of process where that court order gets translated over, but. Yeah, the, the answer is yes. That's a pretty pretty simple one. Yes, it, the statute <laughs> requires, um, requires notice to law enforcement and to CBI um, for entrance into the um, the instant background check system and the statute also requires that the um, the purpo the order the name be removed promptly um, when it is no longer in effect as well. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, interesting uh, question. It's a speculation one about, but I, I think speaks to sort of. Uh, uh, communication across systems, perhaps. So the Colorado Crisis Hotline counselors, uh, question is whether they should provide ERPO referral information when deemed appropriate. Um, the last time that the, the questioner asked, it was not being done. Um, maybe ask you to comment on that. And, and also perhaps more broadly, um, Adam, if you know kind of how the rollout in terms of public education on this has happened or sort of where the resources are, are for people to know how to use it. But first, I guess, maybe the mental health question, if you have a comment on that. Sorry. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, it's a little outside of, um, you know, a little outside of my lane to, to comment on the kind of normative, what should be happening, um, except to say, um, I do think it's important that, um, it's important that that folks are aware that this is a tool, um, and I don't think that it can hurt to um, to give Coloradans the information they need to make informed decisions about uh, whether this is or isn't the right tool to use in their particular circumstances. So I suppose that is a long way to say. Um, in fact, you know, I would weigh in um, and say, um, in terms of yeah, the public education piece and providing information. Um, I think it's 
it's valuable to know that this is one tool that's available um, you know, on a, a kind of emergency um, public health and violence prevention basis. Um, Adam, I thank you. I I, I want to kind of echo that, and I re, I'm realizing now something we haven't really talked about this whole webinar. That that, but as you just mentioned, it's a tool in a in a sort of menu of options, and um, you know there are a lot of voluntary options before you get to the point of of needing an ERPO. And I think um, from someone as someone working in the suicide prevention field, I think it's really important we remember those other tools that are there in terms of voluntary storage options. Uh, sort of encouragement about uh, for an at-risk individual to make decisions themselves uh, to reduce access during times of risk. Um, at the same time, there very, may very well be cases where nothing else has worked. And I think um, we've seen that in some of the, some of the uh, cases we've reviewed this year where it really sounded like family were kind of at their wits end and really worried about someone. Um, so, uh, you know, the Colorado, Colorado crisis hotline, I heard recently they have some menu of 4,000 services and providers or something that they can offer to people. And so you're right, I think it probably makes sense to have this as, um, as one of those options, but, um, but I would hope that the, the takeaway for attendees today is not to jump to this first when someone is suicidal or having thoughts of harming others. There are sort of other things potentially to be tried first. Leslie, do you wanna comment on that too or? I don't mean to cut you out of the conversation. <laughs> no, no, I think I think you both covered it. I think definitely um, we've seen the evidence that the more public education and associated with these with this law, the better. And I think, um, yeah, it it definitely could not hurt to to put that in the Colorado crisis hotline. Yeah. Um, this is a nice question, I think, for us to to kind of end on. Um, long-term implementation or health outcomes um, that we want to follow. And I'm going to add on to that. So first, maybe, Leslie, why don't you answer that one? And then I'm going to ask a bigger kind of long-term question. Do you want to mention the, the next step in the work? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, so implementation, I think we're, we're going to continue to um, collect data on the ERPOs that are being filed in Colorado. Um, and in terms of health outcomes, I mean, ideally, you'd be able to um, connect all of the respondents to um, vital stats data um, or other outcome data to see potentially um, how many negative outcomes um, happened as, um, with these individuals versus how many were potentially avoided. So, um, but it, we, we need more time for that, for those outcomes to occur. So it'll be a, definitely a long-term process. And I think that's part of what that multi-state Evaluation, which I think Emmy is probably going to talk about. Um, well, we'll be on. Yeah, no, I well, I wasn't going to mention in great detail. It's just kind of getting underway. But yeah, I think you know the, because the numbers in each state can be somewhat small. You've got to kind of group data across states. Um, I will say I'm also as an implementation um, outcome really interested to see what happens after a year. I think there have been a lot of questions and understandable concerns from folks about, will I ever get the guns back if they're taken away and uh, you know what happens afterwards? And so I think trying to track some of that will be really important. And I have to be, uh, be honest, I don't quite know how we're gonna do that. I don't know if we, in requesting an ERPO that has now expired, you know, will all of it be in the same file? Is there a different process or not? So um, I think, that speaks to a little bit what Leslie was mentioning about the, the challenges in, from a research perspective of getting some of this information. But, um, but I think uh, it'll be really important to continue to track what happens at the end of ERPOs, but, um, and then also the, the kind of potential misuse that people have been worried about. But I think I, I, we, we really didn't see evidence of this year. There were a couple of cases, as Leslie mentioned, um, where they were inappropriately filed, but none of them were granted. Um, and then some of them had legal action taken. So um, that kind of leads me into so, to, to what I wanted to close with. Um, Adam, do you have a sense from the legal communities, from the AG's office, or uh, what you hear from law enforcement, sort of a wish list for this next year in terms of implementation or tracking or areas for improvement, kind of where we go from here? We are keeping our... Um, our finger on the pulse, um, so to speak, um, in, in trying to figure those things out. I think a lot of it um, 
is anecdotal thus far. We are, um, you know, our office is eager to um, to learn from the research that you all have done um, and in trying to kind of see what some of those trends are, understand, you know, where there are um, gaps in our collective understanding of what's going on um, on the ground. I think we're open to, to hearing from all, all sources uh, as to, you know, what's working well, and we've heard a fair bit of that, as well as, um, you know, where having, having done this for a year, there may be um, areas for, for improvement. I think that will be an ongoing process. I mean, as you note, um, we'll have to see the ERPO cycle, uh, you know, work once, um, you know, go, go all the way through and to, to fully understand where um, there may be kinks or where things are working um, smoothly. So we're like any bill, you know, it's been around for a year. The law has been around for a year and there's, um, there is always the opportunity to, um, to iterate. And I, I would take the moment uh, to say thank you, uh, Emmy, to you, to Leslie, to your team for um, paying careful and rigorous attention to the implementation piece. Um, you know, there is so often in law and policy that um, the world changes and we have these moments to, you know, capture um, meaningfully what is or isn't working to help inform future kind of government practice. And we often let those moments um, pass us by. So I, I do think, um, you know, it's in the, the highest spirit of good governance to be able to have good evidence-based research to help inform that, um, that governance so that we're not, um, you know, policymakers aren't, aren't just speculating. So thank you. Yeah, well, well, thank you. And I think I, I say right back, I mean, I'm, we're so grateful for the partnership with the AG's office, as Leslie mentioned in her presentation. I mean, it, it's hard to navigate this. So I remember way back when we were like, Adam, who do we call? And I think you gave us a name that got us started down this process. So um, I know many states don't have, or don't have necessarily the same relationships between sort of different areas. Um, and it, it's really so much um, so much better when we can find ways to work together, even if we don't speak the same language all the time. So <laughs> we had a chance to really learn from each other. Um, with that, I would say to the audience too, we're, we welcome um, questions, uh, collaborations, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, these are, these are publicly available records, but as Leslie said, they're uh, not for the faint of heart to try to get them all. So we're happy to, to talk offline about um, other questions that folks may have. Um, Leslie, any last thoughts from you? I'll just echo what both of you said. Thank you. <laughs> you. Leslie knows more. I think that my favorite, I have to share my favorite story was one county that wanted us to send them a blank check because they didn't know how much it would be. And we said, no, we can't send blank checks. <laughs> but so so we, appreciate, we appreciate all the help from all the different county clerks that uh, Leslie interacted with as well. Um, Thank you to everybody for joining us today. We will send out a recording um, uh, as well as any um, uh, potentially some resources. And um, if you are interested in joining a much more informal discussion group tomorrow at 4 p.m., please email um, Lucia. She's her her chat is in the her emails in the chat box, or email me for the Zoom link. Uh, it's not publicly available because we're just trying to keep it smaller. But anyone is welcome um, to continue this conversation. Uh, thank you, Leslie, so much for your presentation and hard work. And Adam, thank you so much for all of your support and for joining us today. Um, and with that, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and we will hopefully see you next month. Thank you.